So Dan, uh, welcome to our conversation here. I'm gonna just introduce you uh, briefly and then we're gonna get right into it. Um, uh, Dan is the Director of University Engagement at Upper House, a Christian study center serving the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He leads Upper House's programming for the university community and hosts the organization's podcast. I just got a list today of their podcast series from this year and it's just tremendous. Uh, Dan's the author of The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation, which is what we'll be discussing today. He's also the author of Covenant Brothers, Evangelicals, Jews, and the U.S.-Israeli uh, Relations, and he's written about religion, politics, and foreign policy for the Washington Post, Christianity Today, and the Religion News Service. His academic research has been published in Religion and American Culture, and church history. Prior to journey, joining Upper House, Dan held appointments at the University of Wisconsin and Harvard University. He earned his PhD in American history at the UW-Madison with an MA in history and a BA in philosophy and history from Colorado State University. He also studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So with Dan, we're, uh, with that, we're gonna get into it. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Bob, and with everyone on the call. Looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, hey, uh, I, maybe to start a little bit, I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what's a good historian like you with a, a very impressive Vita doing at a Christian study center, and how does that connect to the book that we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Well, um, if I had my way, every Christian study center would have a staff historian. That would be a great, uh, a great growth opportunity for uh, religious historians all across the country. But um, uh, more seriously, uh, a Christian study center is what we call ourselves here at Upper House. It's a type of ministry, you could say, alongside other models like InterVarsity. Um, you can look up the consortium of Christian study centers. There's about 40 study centers across the country. A lot of them are located like we are next to major uh, R1 universities. And part of our focus uh, at Upper House is to engage the university, uh, not just its people, but the institution itself and the conversations happening at the disciplinary level. So of course, none of us can be more than a specialist, usually in one field, and I happen to be a historian. But we have a number of people on staff at Upper House that are PhDs in their particular field. And part of their job, and part of my job, is to uh, engage faculty and engage departments uh, on conversations that are maybe more specialized and um, harder to penetrate if you're not part of a given field. So that's one reason I'm at Upper House is because uh, Upper House values people with uh, advanced degrees in different fields and and does ministry work uh, on that on that level. Um, I also think uh, study centers are a very new model. Um, there's a there's a, an InterVarsity Press book from a few years ago called To Think Christianly by Charlie Cotherman that really traced the history of Christian study centers. And they're really a post-World War II uh, development. And so one of the things that b made me interested in the model as a historian of American religion was trying to understand where do Christian study centers fit into a much longer history of Christian thought and of the church trying to engage uh, the university. And dispensationalism is is maybe not the most obvious uh, part of that uh, story, but it's a very prominent one. I knew that uh, as growing up uh, as an evangelical and then studying evangelicalism. And one of the most interesting things that uh, I don't spend a lot of time on in the book, but was definitely in the background, was as I was working here at Upper House over the last uh, four years and writing a good chunk of this book while working here, um, I noticed, one, a lot of students come out of a dispensationalist upbringing at UW-Madison, and so a lot of their concerns or the ways they're interpreting their education at UW make a lot more sense when you understand where they're coming from. Uh, there's another thing that we try to do here at UW, at, at Upper House with UW students, is we try to get them to see how their work at UW and their studies at UW are part of a broader kingdom uh, effort. They're part of the God's mission to the world, and that being an engineer and being a chemist or being a historian is just as valuable work as being a, a missionary, a professional missionary, or something like that. And so that, dr that drove me into thinking about kingdom. The, what, what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? What are Christians called to do uh, 
um, in the kingdom. And that gets into questions that get really close to dispensationalism as well, because dispensationalism has a particular way of understanding what the kingdom of God is, what the sort of proper role of the church is in relation to society and the world. And uh, if nothing else, studying this uh, history and writing this book has helped me explore some of that, maybe not from the most obvious angle, but definitely a fruitful angle uh, to understand what exactly are we trying to do here at Upper House and where are the sort of theological stakes in the ground that we want to plant in relation to this longer history of evangelical engagement with the university. So those are some of the ways that this scholarship has intersected with my work here at Upper House. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you're trying to do in the book? Yeah, so you asked at the beginning, what, what comes to mind when you hear the word dispensationalism? And for me, what comes to mind is the bookshelf that I had as a kid, or my, my dad's bookshelf. And my dad had this line of books, and I start, I start my own book this way, with these very, it was all capital letters, very imposing theolog theologians, uh, people with the last names of Walford and Ryrie and Pentecost. And this was a whole generation, I didn't know this as a kid, obviously, but this was a whole generation of dispensationalist theologians and scholars who really helped construct an entire subculture, at least the, the theological part of an entire subculture of evangelicalism that was uh, inherently or, or sort of implicitly dispensationalist. And dispensationalism is this tradition of theology that goes back, um, at least how I trace it, to the 19th century. And uh, it certainly has a system of theology goes back that far and is a major part of the story of American evangelicalism from then until now. And so I wanted to uh, I wanted to tell that story. I particularly wanted to intervene in two ways. And the first was on an academic level. There's been a lot of recent history by American historians of religion around uh, sort of writing around dispensationalism, but never addressing it head on. Uh, there's been a lot written on fundamentalism in the last 40, 50 years, a lot written on apocalypticism, on evangelicalism. And these are all terms that are very close to dispensationalism, but don't really take the theology itself as its primary focus of inquiry. And uh, there really hasn't been a, a history of dispensationalism for about 60 years until, uh, mm -hmm. until recently. And you have to go back to sort of these 1960s, almost like first take histories uh, from people like Clarence Bass and others that are trying to, to in the 1960s, give a sense of, of this. Um, and Ernest Sandin is another uh, person who who's doing a history of premillennialism, which is a, another similar term, but not necessarily dispensationalism. So there was, I thought there was an opening for an academic engagement with the history. And there's been a lot of really good monograph work done on different segments of dispensationalism as well in recent years. And then the other intervention was um, a, maybe a more popular one. And I went with Erdman's in part because um, the way when I was talking to Erdman's press, they they really saw a potential for a, a, a wider readership than, than just scholars, was that there are millions of, you might call them ex-dispensationalists. Uh, they might, you know, people who grew up in this world, they might not define their identity today by being not that, but, but they have some past in dispensationalism. And I would count myself among this. I grew up in this world, as I mentioned. I don't count myself a dispensationalist uh, anymore. I don't know if I ever did in the sense of a conscious way, but I certainly internalized the rapture and other key beliefs of dispensationalism uh, up until I was a college age student. But there's a big there's a big group of people who grew up in this world who no longer uh, are necessarily card carrying dispensationalists or believe in the theology, but who are curious about where it all came from and what its broader effects have been on the church. And so I tried to write the book with both of those audiences in mind and tried to give a, a, a story of how this theology emerged, how it rose into quite amazing prominence, particularly given its mm -hmm. roots, and then how it has fallen on harder times in recent years in the academic world. And at the same time, uh, it has taken on this amazing pop culture virality uh, in media, in music, in movies, that is really interesting. It's an interesting uh, sort of question, historical question to try to answer. How did how did it achieve that fate? Um, and how is it still part of the, the texture of evangelical culture, even today in the 2020s, um, as it's it's much uh, much less revered in academic circles today. So that was that was sort of the core question I was interested in. 
um, and and want to do it as as a historian tends to want to do it in a story based format. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a great story. I I I just had fun reading through the history and seeing how things developed and over time and you know kind of situating different people I'd heard about and read about kind of within the history. That was a great account. Hey, you start the story with J.N. Darby, uh, who was part of this very small little group called the Exclusive Brethren in England. Why is he so important to just the history of uh, premillennialism and dispensationalism in the U.S.? So Darby, his name is John Nelson Darby. He's, uh, there's a recent historian, Donald Atkinson. He's a, a historian in the UK who recently wrote a, a big volume on the brethren and, and made the claim that Darby was the fourth most important Protestant in the modern era after Luther, Calvin, and John Wesley. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. That, that seems uh, a, a really... Uh, <laughs> Dan, I think uh, I think you froze on us, or Church of England, and particularly the Church of Ireland. He he spent a lot of time in Ireland, being a priest, and he developed this uh, movement, this uh, brethren. with that dispensational doctrines that go into dispensationalism, sort of a system of Hey Dan, I should mention we're we're having uh, you, it looks like we're having some problems with you freezing up there. And uh, I don't know if there's something on, on your connection on here. We'll uh, we'll have Dan back here in a moment here. Um, uh, maybe while he's getting back on uh, and to give us a little more chance, I will. Um, uh, <laughs> that's right. Has Dan been raptured? OK, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, let me tell you, we'll, uh, let me just put on here. Uh, the book that we're talking about, and we'll 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 do a little book promotion while we're waiting for Dan to get back here. Uh, the book we're talking about is the rise and fall of dispensationalism, and uh, uh, here's some information that we'll actually have in the chat as well about how you can order the book. Um, you can get it through Erdman's. Uh, also, Erdman's has a bookstore at ChristianBook.com where you can actually purchase the book. Uh, for a 30% discount. And so I might suggest that you consider doing that. Um, and we'll get that, let me get that in the chat for us here. Okay, I think we have Dan coming back in here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Let me get you back on screen here. Okay, I think we're um, uh, we got you back here. Uh, hey, while while we were uh, while you were away, I uh, went ahead and uh, uh, promoted your book here a little bit. So um, let me just try to get something, get rid of something here on our screen. Good. Okay. Well, um, sorry for the technological glitch here. You know, uh, we've been mercifully yeah. free of those things. But uh, um, so, can you maybe just give us a quick wrap up on on J.N. Darby uh, and his importance to this movement. You said he was the fourth most important person uh, oh, the, in Protestant history, according to one reckoning. 
That's right. And yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what the, sorry to break the streak of your, um, your technical, uh, perfection there on, on this, but, um, uh, yeah. So yes, Donald Atkinson is a historian who made the claim that Darby might be the fourth most important Protestant. I wouldn't go that far, but he's someone who um, uh, became the leader of this sect within the British dissenter world, the exclusive brethren. And he's credited with being the uh, the originator, or the inventor, and often the systematizer or the early systematizer of what we call dispensationalism today. So a lot of the ideas that make it into dispensationalism as we know it today have roots that are earlier than the 19th century. You can find people going all the way back to the early fathers who carry different parts of what we call dispensationalism now. There tend not to be many that hold the whole bucket of beliefs together in a systematic way. And that's where Darby comes in and becomes one of the key people who who assembles a number of really important doctrines together. When you say he or she is a dispensationalist until the 1920s, uh, actually, but um but he is someone who is important to uh, putting together particularly three teachings or three doctrines. Uh, one of them is the eschatology, which most people know about. And this is the, the, the version that even the left behind novels uh, use to some extent of there being at any moment now a rapture that will translate the true believers, the true Christians up into heaven and kick off a a very long scenario of of end times developments that will culminate in the um the battle of armageddon and the return of jesus and then the establishment of the millennial kingdom and so this is one we, we talk about premillennialism as this bigger doctrine that many protestants hold to dispensationalists are a version of or dispensationalism is a version of premillennialism in the sense that they anticipate jesus coming before the millennium and establishing the millennium. And this contrast with post-millennialists who see it as the role of the church is to basically build the millennium, build the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and then Jesus will come at the end of that era. Part of dispensationalism that Darby was really important to was, was this, this eschatology and this premillennial eschatology that included this any moment rapture. And that was key because Darby was in a world in the 1830s and 1840s where the other premillennialist tradition, what I call the old premillennialists, were very much in the mode of trying to determine the date of the of when all this stuff would happen. And, uh, and they had a sort of way of reading different numbers in the Bible to come up with dates that corresponded to the amount of time that had passed since the French Revolution and, and other things. And Darby rejected all that and wanted to get out of the date setting uh, tradition and created, uh, a, a, or he didn't create, but he developed a system that got him out of that and, and allowed a, a, to sort of move on to other things beyond speculating what exact date the end times would happen. So that's one big part is eschatology. Another is uh, what you could call the ecclesiology or, or the understanding of who the church is in the Bible and in God's plans for redemption. And here dispensationalists may be most known in, in academic theological terms for making a sharp distinction between the church and Israel, as they call it. Or ancient Israel has continuity with the modern Jewish people, and then there is the church, which is a separate people, chosen people of God. So there are multiple peoples of God or chosen peoples of God for most dispensationalists. And this allowed, or th this created the conditions where um, there was a lot of anticipation within dispensationalist circles for what God would do with Israel because uh, the church had not replaced Israel or the church had not superseded Israel. And these are uh, theological terms that are talked about a lot today, supersessionism and replacement theology. And um, and these come out, those terms in particular come out of much more recent theological conversations, but they get at a pretty traditional teaching of almost all Christian traditions up until the 19th century, that the church in, in some really significant way assumed the chosen place that Israel had assumed it had been in the Old Testament. And dispensationalists reject this, Darby rejects this, and this comes out of, in part, his literalistic reading of prophecy and of the promises in the Old Testament in particular that God makes to the Jewish people through the prophets. And while most Christians interpret those in a more spiritualized or um, 
or um, analogize sense to the church today, uh, Darby uh, rejected that. And so dispensationalists tend to reject that as well. So those are two things, the eschatology and the ecclesiology. And the third, which comes and goes, it's it's not as stable, uh, though many dispensations today see it as the core of their teachings, is a what they call now a consistent literal hermeneutic or plain reading of the Bible. And uh, if you talk to a dispensationalist today, they will say that they don't actually have a theology, or it's more like they read the Bible plainly, and then this is these are the beliefs that develop out of that reading. Um and and that's that's certain there's certainly a tradition to that. If you go back to Darby, Darby did read, as I mentioned, the prophecy portions of the Bible in a way that he expected them to be fulfilled in space and time. They weren't just a sort of spiritualized uh, language for something that was going to happen um, invisibly. They were going to the, the prophecies would be hap happening in real real time in the real world. Um, but Darby was not a literalist in the broader sense of the term. He was someone who loved talking um, about uh, metaphors um, and um, typologies and other things that were all throughout the biblical text. That's something that dispensationalists today tend to not do as much of because they're committed to a plain uh, reading of the Bible. But Darby brought these things together. Many of them have a, a older history than Darby and assembled them together in a way that cohered and that created a tradition of thinking and of discourse within the Brethren movement and then quickly expanded beyond and particularly in the United States in the 1860s and 1870s. Well, tell us, you know, yeah, you know, Darby is part of this very small group and he initially seemed to have a lot of influence in some parts of New England and the Midwest. How did this movement kind of explode to become a national movement? Yeah, it, it took a couple generations, and and Darby himself was not a great communicator outside of the Brethren circles. He was a very dense writer. He did not like talking in front of large groups. He was not the sort of poster child for someone who would popularize a particular tradition of theology. But uh, one of the things that I, I was able to contribute with the book that was uh, somewhat new was trying to tie Darby's history and the history of the Brethren to what's happening in the U.S. in the 1860s and 1870s, which is when Darby's visiting the U.S. and really gaining a following, at least for parts of his teachings, particularly around the end times. And what's happening in the U.S. in the 1860s and 70s is the Civil War and Reconstruction, and particularly the the pastors and the leaders who become the champions of Darby's views, at least in some parts of his views, um, come out of the border state region. So the, the, the parts of the U.S. during the 1860s and 1870s that are part of the North during the war, but are very culturally Southern. And so I have very, very divided loyalties. And I mentioned that Darby had a unique ecclesiology, the sense of the church and Israel being very separate. Well, Darby himself was very, you could even say he was a dualist on this, and he saw the church as God's heavenly people and Israel as God's earthly people. And for Darby, anything having to do with politics or society was an earthly concern. A heavenly concern was about um, was about missions and discipleship, basically. And so you can imagine, and this is what happened in places like St. Louis, uh, James Brooks becomes the largest champion of, of uh, dispensational theology in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. Um, he is someone who's in St. Louis who is struggling with how to be a pastor in a border state uh, uh church where uh, he has many Southern sympathizers in his church, but but uh, his state is part of the, the North, and he has to navigate this. And Darby's ecclesiology is very appealing to him. And, and Brooks comes into Darby's uh, sort of psychology through the ecclesiology, through trying to find what is a way to sort of situate the mission of the church in a way that gets out of having to weigh in on um, the Civil War and Reconstruction. And, and to be sympathetic to him, you know, one thing he saw was in the North, and he was a Presbyterian, the Northern Presbyterian churches became hyper-militaristic during the Civil War, hyper-nationalistic. Um, they saw the cause of the North as the cause of the kingdom of God. And this rubbed him the wrong way as well, that this was a little too much giving into worldly interests as the church. And we might look back today and say, well, okay, but they, they were on the right side of the war. And um, uh, but but there's still a, a deeper question there of, of how should the church align itself with worldly powers. So Brooks is someone who became interested in Darby's theology in the late 1860s. He talks about having a conversion to premillennialism in the early 1870s and then becomes a champion.
champion of this view and really develops whole networks of pastors and theologians in the latter half of the of the 19th century um, because of his social situation in part. And another key player uh, on this scene is Dwight Moody, uh, who is the big revivalist of the late 19th century. Dwight Moody's not a theologian. He probably never reads anything by Darby, though he does meet Darby a couple times. And uh, for Moody, it's much less about um, any particular type of, of esoteric theological conversation and more about his evangelism and understanding that time is short, uh, Moody was uh, was uh, like to invoke the rapture and the potential of the rapture as a missionary and evangelistic uh, tool. And for this same reason around sort of weighing political versus what he would consider heavenly concerns, Moody was all about evangelizing the world. And the way he saw that that could happen in the U.S. is if Northerners and Southerners got past Reconstruction, got past lobbying guilt accusations around the Civil War, and got to the work of global missions. And so he was someone who promoted a heavenly view of the church, um, a spiritual view of the church's role in the world, and drew on brethren teachings to make that view, because he, in a sense, did not want to get involved in debates over racial justice or the guilt of the Civil War, and thought missions was a much more important cause. And so the ecclesiology of Darby, of the brethren, gave him the tools uh, to do that. So I track throughout the book sort of the influences of, of these teachings on this generation of evangelicals in the U.S. and how the global missions mindset really gave them a, a, a motive for adopting a theology that looked a lot like Darby's and, and often you can source it to um, them citing Darby or citing other brethren for where they're developing these views that both gave the, that evangelical generation massive um, energy and motive to build a global missions movement, but also to back out of uh, very uh, naughty conversations around race and reconstruction in the U.S. at the same time. Well, we're, um, you know, we're not going to have a chance to get to all the 20th century uh, history um, uh, and, uh, so I would really encourage people to, to get the book, to get the rest of the story here. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk with you about the influence of, of, of dispensationalism. Your subtitle talks about, uh, how the evangelical battle over the end times shaped a nation. And I, I wonder, and, and you mentioned earlier, even some of the ways that some of your students, some of the students you interact with at the study center have been shaped by uh, being raised in dispensational backgrounds. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the influence of dispensationalism on the wider uh, U.S. scene. Right. And I mean, one way it's been really influential is that for uh, about 50 years, I would say maybe even longer, from the 1890s to the 1940s, 1950s, dispensationalism was at the core of what we would call the evangelical movement in the United States and then the fundamentalist movement uh, after the 1920s. And part of this was through the institution building. Most of the, not most of, but but a good chunk of the, the Christian colleges and universities we see today were started as Bible institutes in the late 19th century. Places like Biola University, uh, Bible Institute of Los Angeles is where that name comes from, um, were founded by dispensationalists and had a very strong missionary bent. And those institutions are still with us today, of course. Global missions is another area where many of the missions agencies that still exist and are still really active in global missions were founded by dispensationalists in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then while we don't do as many Bible conferences and uh, Bible camps today as what we did 100 years ago or 150 years ago, those uh, networks were dominated by dispensationalists. Uh, and many of them were founded by dispensationalists in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So much of the infrastructure of modern evangelicalism is uh, is owed a debt to dispensationalism. And it, you know things have changed and, and different uh, leaders have come and, and, and reshaped some of that theology. Um, but, uh, but it's really important to acknowledge that, that, that a lot of evangelicalism and to the extent that evangelicalism has shaped American culture um, is owed to dispensationalism. On a broader sense, um, uh, dispensationalism has been uh, sort of the, the themes of dispensationalism, the themes of premillennialism, of a decline in the world, uh, of, of sharp ruptures in uh, history, um, and of, of a future redemption uh, that will come uh, 
um, maybe from from an outside force. Um, I find these all over the place, either in people who grew up in a dispensationalist world who then left that and have written in culture or politics um, or on direct influences. Uh, if you think of the 1970s, for example, um, the best-selling book of the decade, the non best-selling nonfiction book of the decade was How Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth, which was a yep. popularized version of dispensationalist eschatology, sold over 10 million copies in that decade, and really shaped a whole generation of, of Christians and, and beyond Christians, and really shaped a lot of what we might call the futurology of the last 50 years, the way that people are sort of trying to read the tea leaves of what's coming next for American society or Western society or the globe. Um, th those can be traced back to really key dispensationalist contributions. And then in an even wider sense, um, I talk about the end of the book, a sense that in, in many ways, uh, the U.S. has a secularized premillennialism um, at, in the way it talks about what's coming next in uh, in U.S. history. And if you compare it to, say, the 1950s or 60s, where if you just take something like sci-fi or, or TV, there's a very optimistic sense of where humanity was going, of where the earth was going, of where science would take us. And if you if you fast forward to today, there's a lot of uh, pessimism or there's even a lot of opaqueness about what exactly is coming next. I mean, we're all talking about AI right now. What is the future of that? And there, there's a lack of of optimism, a lack of certainty about the future. I don't want to credit all that to dispensationalism for sure. But I want to say that dispensationalism and the way it is manifested in pop culture has been part of the equation for how Americans more broadly have talked about the future and talked about whether we're declining or rising and whether that's an inevitable decline or or something we can we can change and ultimately whether there's a spiritual solution to that or there's a technical or social solution uh, to improving uh, the to improving the world for the future. I think dispensations have been involved on all those levels in various ways, maybe not at the elite levels of culture, uh, in the same way that that a place like you know Harvard University would be or something like that, but certainly on the popular level, it'd be hard to tell that story uh, without dispensationalists in the mix. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, hey, uh, we're going to move right into audience Q and A here. Uh, I think we have a couple of things already in here. Um, uh, Min Minsuk, uh, uh, I hope you're. I'm getting close to pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, she says, I've heard of studies of American economic history during the Great Depression that trace the rise of the fundamentalist evangelical parachurch group and its close collaboration with corporate capitalism in opposition to the New Deal. I'm curious about how the anti-New Deal political camp connected with parachurch group leaders who held a dispensationalist worldview and who played key roles or served as intermediaries. Interesting. Yeah, great, question. great question. Um, yes, there, there's some definite overlap there. I would say the best book on this is um, Darren Dochuk's work, um, both on uh, one of his older books is called From Bible Belt to Sun Belt that looks at um, a lot of these developments. Um, and he also has a, a newer book on, on actually the oil industry and its relationship to religion. And you see a lot of this um, collaboration or this overlap between uh, capitalists, uh, and, um, uh, and anti-New Deal activism as well, um, in that. I would say broadly, uh, it depends. This is one of the distinctions I wanted to make in the book. There are at least two types of, of dispensationalists, uh, traditions of dispensationalism. There's many different types of dispensationalists. I don't get into that as much in the book, but there's two types of traditions. One is a more scholarly tradition, and that might be represented by that bookshelf I grew up with, with people like Walford Ryrie, and Pentecost, uh, these theologians at Dallas Theological Seminary writing pretty dense texts. There's another tradition, which is a more popular tradition. How Lindsay represents that, the Left Behind novels represent that. And if you go back into the 1920s, there's definitely a nationalist, populist, popular, uh, dispensationalist tradition that aligns with these anti-New Deal uh, politics, and um, and is and is anti-communist as well, and so sees capitalism as part of sort of God's um, good ordered creation. Capitalism is is part of that. Uh, one key figure that I talk about that a lot of people have talked about is William Bell Riley, who was in the the Twin Cities, had a sort of media empire, um, uh, had a school, had a big church, and was a national figure in the anti-evolution movement in the 1920s. 
and then was a major opposer of the New Deal in the 1930s. And someone who um, was widely respected among the fundamentalists, uh, he helped create a number of fundamentalist organizations. Um, he was also someone who trafficked in anti-Semitism and, and, and merged that with uh, anti-communism and became a very problematic figure at the end of his life uh, for some of those views, including um, uh, lending support in the 1930s to the Silver Shirts, which was a, a sort of Nazi, American Nazi organization. Very uh, you know, interesting history, very complicated history. But he's someone who, who merged dispensationalist teachings with these politics. And he set the tone, you could say, or set a model for a type of populist, nationalist, dispensationalist engagement that tracks uh, through the rest of the 20th century. Um, and people will cite him. People like Tim LaHaye, who came later, uh, was the key, obviously, co-author of the Left Behind novels, but also very involved in the Christian right and Republican politics um, it, all through, you know, uh, much, very recently when he died. Um, he's someone who cited Riley as, a, as an inspiration and a, as a model. And other people like Jerry Falwell and others come out of the same uh, Baptist tradition and and modeled uh, modeled their politics the same way and and wedded them to this dispensational theology. So there's definitely a story there. And a lot of it does. I actually focus a lot on the 1930s and 1940s for where there's this fusion, as one um, dispensationalist at the time called it, of of politics and theology walking hand in hand. And they were they were actually wanting that to happen. And uh, that comes out of this period in particular. Hmm. So those precedents go a lot further back than the 1970s and 80s. Uh, uh, That's right. That's many right. of us are more familiar with. Um, Greg asks the question, um, he quotes a Bible verse that often is used in terms of the place of Israel. He says, this is what the Lord says, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease to be a nation before me? And uh, he asks if you would comment uh, uh, on that verse in sure. the, some of your work. Yeah, well, I get to I get to back out a bit and say I'm a historian, not a theologian. I I am not going to be able to competently uh, marshal pro or, or anti interpretations of that verse um, for a pro or anti dispensationalist reading. What I can do is say, um, you know, these verses, this one among many others, have been the center of constant conversation going back to at least the 19th century, of course, and way before that. And I think one of the, even just reading this verse, um, you know, one of the key questions would be what here is is referenced when uh, it says Israel. And dispensationalists tend to say there's one definition of Israel throughout the entire Bible, and that is of the, the, um, the Jewish people, the people covenanted sort of the seed of Abraham in a, in a genetic sense. Um, that is one reading, but that is not the only reading in church history. And it's actually been the minority reading for most of church history. And so um, uh, a lot of how you take the meanings of these these verses goes back to some of your priors or your commitments to how you're going to read read the text. And what dispensationalists did, starting with Darby and going forward, was they created a a, a system to read not just this text, but but all the Bible through. And then they created the institutions to perpetuate that reading and to actually train pastors and theologians and others to have that reading. Um, but they weren't the only ones doing that. And one of the, the storylines I trace through the book, is, particularly in the 20th century, is this development that happens within the evangelical world between what end up being called covenantalist and dispensationalist theologians or traditions. And a lot of our denominations today still break down on, are they more covenantalist in their theology or more dispensationalist in their theology? And um, both of these uh, traditions come out of the fundamentalist movement. They both have their constituents and they spend a lot of the next few decades, the 1940s through the 1960s, building institutions to try to, in a sense, win this argument within the conservative Protestant world in the US, which type of theology, which type of reading of Jeremiah 31 is going to be the one that influences the most people. Mm 
So um, as a historian, that's more interesting to me than weighing in right now and saying, well, this is the proper way uh, to read that verse. It's to say, isn't it interesting how uh, these readings of the Bible really created a lot of the mid 20th century infrastructure of evangelicalism, its seminaries, its churches, its journals, um, its magazines would take would, would, would sort of side with one or the other, either a covenantalist or a dispensationalist reading um, in order to make sense of 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 the Bible. Um, and so that, that's where I'll leave it there. Um, I, I will not weigh into anything more uh, theological on how to read that verse. I'm going to move on to Tim Ballard's uh, question. Uh, I'd love to have you differentiate your research from Matthew Avery Sutton's American Apocalypses. He emphasizes fundamentalists' active role in politics and formative role in shaping anti-New Deal politics. Essentially, um, essentially, he claims that their stated division between the spiritual and the mundane didn't keep them from politics. So, yes. Yes, and Matt is a good friend, um, someone who read multiple drafts of this book um, as I was writing it. And um, one of my first reviews as a grad student uh, was of his book in 2014, American Apocalypse. So I know the work well. Um, I would say the the primary distinction that I try to make in in my book that is different than Matt's is, is actually isolating dispensationalism as a particular tradition within American evangelicalism, whereas Matt is much more interested in a broader category of premillennialism. And for Matt, that is really useful to him. And I think it takes him very far in his book in understanding that there's this broader premillennial culture, subculture, that does exactly what this uh, what Tim says it does, which is it 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 connects theology to politics, and really contrary to how a lot of people would assume a premillennialist theology would, um, it, it, it motivates people to act in the world and to get political and to get involved in uh, politics and society. Um, I have nothing against that, but but what I read is that actually one of the more interesting stories is how premillennialism itself isn't a stable category, and it actually has divisions within it. Uh, including between dispensationalists and other premillennialists. That really goes a long way to show some of the developments later on in the story. And so where Matt sees a lot of um, shared premillennialism, I draw distinctions between dispensationalists and other premillennialists. And this helps me explain things like um, why the Schofield Bible emerges when it does. Uh, the Schofield Bible is probably the key popular version of the Bible. Uh, it has it just annotations to the King James version of the Bible that are dispensationalist notes uh, written by uh, Cyrus Schofield. This book emerges, this version of the Bible emerges in 1909, which is really an important date because right before that, most uh, dispensationalists, people who had dispensationalist distinctives, hung out with other premillennialists, which is a much broader tradition in American uh, Christianity. But because of divisions that happened in the late 19th century, um, they split. And there was an attempt by the dispensationalist premillennialists against the other premillennialists to, just like later on with the covenants, the covenantalists and the dispensationalists, to basically popularize their version of eschatology. And so Schofield's book is not just a statement of dispensationalist beliefs, but it's this polemic within the premillennialist world for trying to get the dispensationalist reading uh, to be the popular one. And it succeeds, by the way. It, it becomes the dominant uh, premillennialist tradition for the next generation. So those are the types of things I can uh, emphasize that Matt uh, doesn't because he doesn't have the same category. I would say Matt's book is in a very strong lineage of histories of evangelicalism that go back to Ernest Sandin's important book in 1970, The Roots of Fundamentalism, that combines all premillennialists into one category. And I really wanted to emphasize, again, as I said at the beginning, that dispensationalism was an important, distinctive tradition that developed, and it, it, it sort of shares history with these other uh, categories, but is also interesting just on its own. Well, um, you know, I think we're uh, going to have to uh, start bringing our time to conclusion. I, I, I will mention, by the way, I, I had brought. I was going to ask you about Schofield, and I brought one of my treasures, what, essentially what was on my dispensational shelf, which was my grandmother's Schofield Bible, uh, along with some of her marginal notes and 
uh, all of his. It has the it has the 1917 preface in it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this was a uh, that was my own show and tell for our conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, Dan, I wanted to um, invite you to have the last word here and uh, uh, just uh, take us out in terms of uh, your thoughts about. Uh, you tell us, you know, anything you want to tell us about the importance of this book and why you think people ought to get it, and anything else that you have to say. Yeah, well, I, I would say if if um, if what we've talked about here whets your appetite, there's um, there's a there's a lot more where this sort of looking at the different theological camps within evangelicalism and fundamentalism, there's a lot more where that comes from uh, in the book. I would like to to end actually on uh, uh, Greg made a comment right after. Um, uh, later on, he said, so dispensationalism seems to have propagated the Christian faith. This strikes me as being a positive outcome. And I agree with him. And uh, while I am not a dispensationalist, and I have some quite uh, critical things from a historian's perspective to say about popular dispensationalism, um, and I also sort of just trying to play a referee here, I think uh, academic dispensationalism has fallen on hard times. All that being said, um, what I what this book is not is some type of polemic against dispensationalism as a theology that I'm not even equipped to make that argument. And that wasn't the point of the book. And I want to I want to actually end. Uh, I want to highlight a quote I have at the end of my introduction, which is from one of dispensationalists uh, biggest uh, critics in the 20th century, George Eldon Ladd. He was a professor at Fuller Seminary uh, for many years, but he was a premillennialist of the non-dispensationalist type. And here's where these distinctions that I make help me sort of tell parts of the story that other historians can't. And this is a quote from Ladd, who spent the first part of his career basically critiquing dispensationalism. And he says, this is from 1952, he says that it was doubtful if there has been any other circle of men other than dispensationalists who have done more by their influence in preaching, teaching, and writing to promote a love for Bible study, a hunger for the deeper Christian life, a passion for evangelism and zeal for missions in the history of American Christianity. And you might not you might not agree with that, uh, the, the sort of uh, fullness of that statement, but I certainly saw that in the historical record, that dispensationalists were very committed to evangelism and to teaching the Bible. And I think if you talk to a lot of people, even today who grew up in that world, me included, these are some of the things that um, ex-dispensationalists take with them from the tradition. Um, so, uh, I want to balance that quote and say, I want to affirm that. And I want to say, there's a lot to learn here, even for, uh, people who are dispensationalists from my book, even, even if it is critical at times, uh, but of course that quote's incomplete and there's a lot more to the story than the things it lists as well. And, and I try to go through some of that, uh, in the book as well. But what the book isn't is some type of uh, polemical book. Uh, it is attempting to be a history to update uh, a historical understanding of this um, and to do it in a way that is hopefully entertaining uh, as a story. Um, so with that, thanks, Bob. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, being on the call. It's been fun talking to you. Likewise. Um, I know we've gotten a few questions at the last minute. We'll leave the connection after we end the recording. We're, we're going to leave the connection open for a few minutes and if Dan has some time to talk about some of those things, you're welcome to stay on and engage with him if you have the time. So with that, um, let me once again put into our chat uh, some of the information about how to get Dan's book. Um, also in the chat, I've put the information about our next call and uh, uh, our, our next conversation. Uh, let me just share a little bit, of, share my screen here with a little bit of that information. So as you, uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, our book today is uh, Dan Hummel's uh, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. And you can either order it directly from Erdman's uh, with this link or at uh, christianbook.com, which I think is currently offering a 30% discount on the book, which is $9 off. Uh, or you can get it what, whatever your preferred bookseller is. Um, our next conversation, um, I think a lot of people have really uh, struggled with uh, what's happening in the landscape of the church in this country. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, after four decades of ministry, Anglican Bishop Todd Hunter is no stranger to the experiences of betrayal and pain in the church. 
but he's still hopeful. He's a leader of the church. He uh, he believes more than ever that Jesus is who the world needs and that Jesus has plans for his followers, that uh, the story's not over. Uh, he is the uh, he leads the churches for the sake of others, a diocese of the Anglican Church in North America. And he's the founding pastor of Holy Trinity Church. And so that conversation is going to be on October 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I, uh, the registration link is in the chat, and you're welcome to sign up for that today if you'd like to join us. Finally, uh, we just want to say thanks uh, to everyone who uh, was a part of the conversation today. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us today and talking about your book. Um, we appreciate the Urbans folks for the work that they've done and for the review copy that I got uh, uh, to be able to engage our conversation. Uh, our conversation is hosted by the Emerging Scholars Network. Uh, you are welcome uh, not only to join these conversations, but we'd love to have you join the Emerging Scholars Network. Just go to blog.emergingscholars.org and there's a join button at the top of the page. Uh, you can find other information about uh, the Emerging Scholars Network on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just go to at ESNIVCF. And finally, um, this uh, video and other videos uh, that we have done are posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to youtube.com slash ESNIVCF and uh, view those videos or share them with other people, which we would love for you to do. So with that, we're going to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, we uh, really appreciate those of you who've been a part of the conversation.